Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the National Building Museum. My name is Chase Rind, I'm the executive director here and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's program. And I particularly want to uh, welcome a number of the staff members of our very own council member, uh, Tommy Wells. I know most of his staff is here this evening. The uh, Museums for the Greener Good lecture series calls on experts from diverse backgrounds to investigate links between environmental sustainability and design, public health, energy policy, infrastructure, education, and even popular culture. Tonight's urban agriculture discussion will be a conversation about the growing movement to investigate the ecological impact of how and where we produce food. This program is about a topic you might not think has a direct link to the National Building Museum, but actually, food is directly related to the built environment. How we grow it, transport it, market it, and consume it. It's about how supermarket produce travels an average of 1,500 miles along a network of highways. It's about how we decide to use the land in our cities and towns. It's about utilizing the environment that surrounds us to re uh, reconnect us to our food and how losing that connection has dire consequences. Urban agriculture greatly reduces a food's carbon miles and makes our cityscapes and landscapes more visually pleasing. Most importantly, urban agriculture has the potential to reconnect us with what we put on our plates and by doing so, reconnect us to a shared heritage, healthier lifestyle, and more engaging world around us. Our program this evening has been designed to incorporate your questions and thoughts and is meant to be uh, conversational in format. So we will, we will break periodically to take your comments and questions from the audience. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Kelly Caffarelli, president of the Home Depot Foundation and a trustee of the National Building Museum. The museum and the foundation work together as partners in sustainability with the goals of sharing best practices in sustainability among design and building professionals, as well as implementing innovative technology to reach a wider audience for discussion of green issues. This lecture series is made possible through the very generous support of the Home Depot Foundation, and we really greatly appreciate that Kelly and members of her staff are able to join us this evening. We have assembled an impressive panel from across the nation representing a wide range of viewpoints, and Kelly will be introducing our moderator for this evening. Kelly? Good evening. I, um, we don't, uh, our office is not here in DC, so it's always a great pleasure to be here, um, not only in the city, but at the National Building Museum. Uh, I am always in awe of this building, and I'm so glad that you all have joined us here tonight. We are so proud of our partnership with the National Building Museum. The Home Depot Foundation is very pleased to be the sustainability partner. Uh, and when we came to the building museum about three years ago and said, we want to partner with you to be sure people are thinking about the long-term affordability of homes and communities because of the impact that buildings have on people and on their lives. And the museum has really embraced the partnership, this lecture series. I don't know about you, but when I get my flyer in the mail about what's coming up at the museum, I always look at it anxiously to see what what the lecture series are going to be on any given month because they are all so engaging, so timely. And I think that this lecture in particular uh, is uh, something that people are thinking about and um, we talk a lot about sustainability with the Home Depot Foundation because we do want to talk about long-term affordability for families, but I always have to stop myself a little bit because we talk about green building and eco-friendly uh, design and all those things, but you know, Green building is just smart building. And it's really what we were doing 100 years ago, many centuries ago, before we thought we were smarter than Mother Nature. And we thought we could outdo her. Um, and we've come back around to understanding that we need to design buildings with nature. We need to design our communities with nature. And urban agriculture is just another piece of that, right? 
I think of uh, new urbanism as Mayberry RFD, if you really think about it, walkable communities, mixed use, mixed income, and you know, urban agriculture is really the same thing, right? It's community gardens, backyard gardens, uh, eating healthier, eating more uh, affordably, and building a sense of place and community for uh, all our people. So uh, thank you again for joining us this evening. I have the pleasure of introducing Allison Arif. And before I read her um, bio, I just have to say that what I'm most impressed by is the fact that she wrote a book called Trailer Travel, a visual history of mobile America, and also uh, edited a book including Airstream, a history of the land yacht. So a little um, uh, hint to the mobile trailer all across America, but we're so glad to have Allison joining us. Uh, she's had a, a wonderful career editing books for Random House, Oxford University Press, and Chronicle Books, um, and was the editor-in-chief of Dwell Magazine, as well as the mag magazine's founding senior editor, and currently writes the By Design column for the New York Times. She's lectured extensively at the Architectural League of New York, the Commonwealth College of California, UCLA, and the Hearst Lectures at Cal Poly, among others. She received her BA in History from UCLA, her MA in Art History from UC Davis, and completed her PhD course in American Studies at New York University. I'm feeling a little stupid right now, but um, we've dragged Allison here from San Francisco where she does have a 500 square foot urban garden in her backyard. So Allison, thank you so much. Thank you for the shout out to all the trailer books. I remain a fan, um, but I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk about urban agriculture. Um, as was just mentioned, I not only write about it, but I also grow it in my own backyard. I have a lot of arugula, broccoli, garlic, onions growing right now. Amazing tomato crop in the summer. Um, but I'm pleased to introduce uh, our panelists. We'll talk for a while and then we'll open it up to all of you for questions and uh, go from there. So to my direct right, I've got Josh Fertil, the president of Slow Food USA, Liz Falk, director and co-founder of Common Good City Farm, and Steve Cohen, who manages food policy and programs for the City of Portland's Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. So we have five million ways to go in this discussion. So I thought we'd start by throwing out a big picture question. So is it always the case that you need urban agriculture? Um, do we really need farms in urban areas? Do we have to have them in all urban areas? Uh, are there places where we shouldn't have them, uh, places where they make more sense? And uh, if we could just maybe begin by tackling that very broad question. We can start with you, Josh. Well, I guess the way I think of it is we, we all eat, and so we're all connected to agriculture. And eating is an agricultural act, wrote Wendell Berry. And in that way, uh, I think it's important that we have urban agriculture for a lot of reasons. One is that um, it can be more sustainable, it can give uh, people more health, it can give people more pleasure, but another that I think we forget is that by learning our connection to place, our connection to land, uh, we can actually become better environmental stewards, and better citizens, better community members, and I think people who live in urban areas deserve to have that, and we'll, we'll, kids will grow up uh, better environmentalists by having that connection. Um, it's also a source of community in a really powerful way. Mm -hmm. I think that real communities are built out of sharing food and sharing work, mm -hmm. and an, an urban garden plot gives people a chance to do both in a way that builds something really powerful there. Okay. Um, Liz, do you see any downsides to having urban agriculture? Um, I, I don't think so. I think um, a lot of my neighbors would say rats. But um, I think it's a myth. If you do your gardening right and you do your composting right, and um, the rats are in the city and we're not attracting them by, by growing food in the city, no. And uh, Steve, maybe you could talk a bit about some of the efforts that Portland's making in this area right now that support the argument for urban agriculture. On the, that, that question about the need for urban agriculture, I think that we, at this point, are so disconnected from the food that we eat. And if you look at the history 
you know, over the last 50, 60 years, it's been an increasingly um, difficult um, to connect to the food, whereas years ago, most of that food was grown right outside your door. Uh, you had a direct connection to that taste and the, the freshness and, and the food that you have. We don't have that anymore. So I think just by modeling that kind of behavior, uh, being able to go out and see what it takes to put something in the ground and have something return that tastes so wonderful and is such a visceral experience that it can only help to put us in touch to what farmers, people are doing on a much greater scale, are involved in. And it, there's really a connection back to the food and the, the sense that we've lost. And we've done that in a, in a lot of ways. One of the, the more recent projects, like right here in DC, we do have a city hall garden. Uh, we had thought about it, but before the new administration came in, by the, the, the time we, we had a, a new administration coming in as well. And just that fact that when you walk into city hall and you see on either side of the doorway that there's food being grown, it's a real connection to what is possible in the city and that food is grown and it's given to a loaves and fishes that's two blocks away. So there are some additional benefits as well. But we've done that. We've also been able to look at the land that we have in the city and is city owned in a project that was called the Diggable City specifically. And it looked at all of the parcels the city owned for its viability for urban agriculture. And again, modeling that behavior that if we are going to encourage people to grow their own food within the city, we first need to look at the land that we have and see what's possible um, and what we, what we can do. Oh, that's great. I, I, um, I wanted to talk a bit about first a personal experience and how that can get us to a larger issue. So I have about five, 600 square feet of an urban farm in my backyard in San Francisco. I'm lucky enough to have a, a giant backyard and sort of have gone through this amazing euphoria followed by disappointment returning to almost euphoria again about it. Because we started working with someone, a mortgage broker actually, who had quit his job to become an urban farmer and start and wanted to sort of design an urban CSA. So following off the CSAs that most of us are familiar with, but to grow everything in San Francisco in people's backyards so those people could have what they grew, but then they could also distribute it, uh, the, the former mortgage broker could distribute it and sell it as urban CSA boxes throughout the city. Um, wonderful idea. They had a waiting list of hundreds of people and by the end of the first year had nearly 100 farms planted throughout San Francisco. Completely feel-good experiences. We had potlucks and picnic picnics with these people. We had uh, 15 farms just in my neighborhood in the city. Uh, then s over the summer we started not seeing our farmer anymore and then got an email saying that it was going to cost ten dollars more a week and and no real explanation of why this was happening and the business model failed and the whole thing sort of splintered and dissolved for a while and it was actually kind of devastating because you did get so invested in it and I bring this up only because I feel like there's a lot of celebration around this movement and I think there also needs to be uh, sort of a lot of case studies that explain uh, how it can work and how it can't work. What's happened is we now work directly with the farmer who is working on our backyard. And ultimately our goal sort of as a neighborhood is to set up a nonprofit so that we could donate the uh, excess stuff that we grow. But I think uh, an essential issue for urban agriculture is if we train someone you know, out of college or you know, out of high school to, to learn this craft, to learn this trade, is there a sustainable business model? Can someone earn a living doing it? Is there a model for this to happen within cities? And um, I'd love the panelists to speak to that. Um, I think it's a really interesting point and um, gets to your first question as well and um, that you asked Josh, which in the city is where the people are and we have gotten into this system of, of trucking um, our food thousands and thousands of miles from within our country and across the world to us in the city where most people live. Um, so I don't think that by growing food in the city we're, we're going to put small farmers out of business. We all, there's enough, there's enough people that we need to continuously feed all of us. Um, I think it's a matter of connecting the dots between the for-profit, um, the chefs and the schools um, and the, the restaurants that, that need food and the individual people. Um, and there's enough, there's enough part of each sector of the economy and the local food economy and the food economy as a whole that, that we can all fill a niche so that we can make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes and rather actually working collaboratively together. 
I think there's a lot of models out there that do show that it exists. I know Philly has done a lot of work on some urban farms where they've shown that they've been able to grow 60,000 and above per acre. Um, they use a technique called spin farming and a lot of the work that's uh, been done in Philly, which is small plot intensive, which is growing in very small spaces for market gardens. So you're doing three or four seasons and you're planting those rows over and over again. Uh, locally in Portland, there are a number of small farmers. Uh, there's, there's a guy who does this, exactly what you're talking about in your community, who does it by bicycle. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it has been successful. There's two women, your backyard farmer, where they have a couple of different models. They will come to your backyard. They will show you exactly what you need to do. It's a turnkey operation and they will help you get established and eventually turn it over to you or they will come to that garden as well and they will garden it for you they every time they do another 75 farms which is what they are called they get to add another person onto their staff and they've been phenomenally successful at doing this it's hard work i mean no one no one here is going to deny that fact that this is not easy and that you have to have you've got to love it to do it and that raises the point that there's a lot of job opportunities within urban agriculture and within farming in general. And if we can think of these nonprofits as many of these projects start as, as the potentially being businesses and business models that are sustainable, then we're not all grant dependent. We're not going through a cycle of mm -hmm. constantly needing to fundraise where our product is something we all need. We can make a specialty added product, a value added product, like a sauce or a specialty herb or a tea and sell it at a higher cost. And, and there's so much training potential in all of those possibilities that, that you can also be hiring people from your community to work at these projects and have, have an extensively large impact. I think there is a, there is a challenge though. I, when I was just out of college, I had saved up some money from working uh, in the summers. I had about $3,000 and I, I invested it in starting a small farm on some land that someone let me use in a suburban area. And um, I got a call from my dad right after I made this decision saying, you know, you saved up a little money. I think you should think about how you invest it. I know it's not much, but it's a good exercise to go through that now that you're out of college. And I, I said, dad, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I'm very heavily invested in drip irrigation and I can't afford to <laughs> diversify right now. My portfolio is pretty <laughs> homogenous. And so I bought all this drip tape and some fencing and started this farm. And worked crazy hours, you know, 90 hour weeks. I had a really solid business model for my place. We were in an area where there was a very high, uh, high I could grow a really high value crop and sell it to a very wealthy uh, group of customers at a farmer's market and grow a relatively small volume. It was, a, it was sort of the best model for how you make money uh, growing vegetables in, in the Northeast. Um, there were two big problems. One is the people who I really cared about in the food system who were getting hurt by the food system certainly couldn't afford the product. And that was a real challenge. Uh, the other was I was really successful at the end of the year, um, at the end of that season, I, I had made a profit of eleven dollars or $12,000, which just seemed great to me. And then I realized, wow, $11,000 a year is not really <laughs> going to work. And, and that was a big realization for me. And I know uh, a lot of you might have followed the movement for green jobs, a really important, vibrant movement that's emerged. And um, Ban Jones was pushing this movement. He wasn't talking about agricultural jobs in urban areas. Um, he was talking about installing solar panels and weatherizing houses. And he wanted this historically excluded, historically excluded communities to be able to access a new green economy. And I pushed him at one point on that. And so did some other people I know saying, well, farming, particularly urban farming, can be a green job. And the response wasn't farming is not green or that's not what I think of when I think of environmentalism. He said, absolutely, except that farming jobs stink uh, financially. If we're trying to lift people out of poverty in this new green economy, um, I'm not going to go to the hill or to these communities and advocate that they become urban farmers because, hey, here I was selling to people in Greenwich, Connecticut, and I made $11,000 a year. And on some level, he was right. And it presents a real challenge that I think the whole sustainable food movement needs to address, which is we, we can't either give farmers a fair price or have real people be able to access real food. It, that can't be either or. We have to find it a, a, for it to be both and. And that creates, a, I think, a real financial challenge, and it's a business model challenge, and it's a market challenge for a sustainable food system. Yeah, I, I absolutely think it is, and uh, I'm sure there are other examples, but I do know that the University of San Francisco, for example, has an urban agriculture minor and is putting together a program on sort of helping to develop uh, that kind of model. And I think it's really interesting what you say about Van Jones, and, and uh, I'm wondering what sort of partnerships could uh, you all envision that might allow for 
this to become a more viable model? Would it be, as you mentioned, making sauces or jams or things that was more high end? Uh, we've also talked about um, direct relationships with schools or hospitals, say, that the farm would then be directly related. And maybe people could speak to those connections that I think aren't being made very much uh, as yet. Certainly connecting the yeah. this private sector and the nonprofit sector and the government sector. But then there's also, at Common Good City Farm, our mission is to provide food for low-income people in D.C. And so we've been doing that for three years. Um, and we're constantly changing um, how we do that based on what we receive feedback from, from the community and the people that we're working with and what's out there in the country and what's working and what's not. Um, so we're, we're always evolving. And some of what I've been reading about most more recently is what other countries do um, for, for whether they're a developing nation and they're all low income or for low income people in particular. And part of, part of that thought process is, is I look at specifically Bangladesh and micro enterprise um, businesses is, is giving low income people the potential to get out of being low income, um, whether it's a micro credit opportunity. And so if you, if you give people the power to be leaders or to change their own lifestyle, give them the education and the tools to do so, then they might be changing their, they might actually do it um, and be leading some of the urban agriculture projects, for example. So um, the Grameen Bank is, is, is the project in Bangladesh that has done this really successfully. And amazingly in Bangladesh, the um, micro, micro credit program works tremendously with, with, with with people in poverty there. And I think we could do something similar in the United States within our cities. And I keep thinking about urban areas and saw in EPA statistics that currently we have 20 million acres of lawn on which we dump, I think it was like 67 million pounds of chemicals, pesticides, as well as fertilizers. And I, th I think it was something like 30% to 60% of water is taken up for those lawns. Someone's spending a lot of time maintaining those lawns. Where do we go? How do we switch that over that we start looking more at edible landscapes, that we start looking at taking, and not all of them are going to be appropriate. I mean, we have to deal with shade. We have to deal with, you know, obviously that the land is going to be appropriate to be able to grow food. But how do we make that change? How do we start employing some of those folks that are doing all of that lawn maintenance to just start thinking about maybe it's possible to produce food in those same spaces. I think a really interesting thing when it comes to growing food is, is people often put food growing just through a business lens and they don't put other uses of land through a business lens. So you would never ask a park to turn a profit, right? Um, and I think it's important, one, yes, there should be a revenue piece and I think that that's important and people should be creative and smart about driving revenue to support the programs or the urban ag projects they're doing. But I also think it's, it's uh, unreasonable and, and sort of silly to expect that an urban ag plot is going to turn a profit like a business in that space would or like a, you know, someone who is trading stock in that space would. It, it's not going to be a high return on investment financially in the way that it might be, and I saw someone give a look with trading stock. I got a call from my dad the day after the stock market fell 600 points, and he said, oh, I should have invested in drip tape. And <laughs> so there's also an element of stability linked to, to using space this way. Um, the other is that there are these services that those spaces provide that are really important to acknowledge and, and apply value to, I think, where there are environmental services. An urban agriculture plot can hold uh, water that would otherwise run off um, it can lock up carbon. It can do a lot of things that have environmental value. There's a public health value um, in that people who are eating locally grown fresh vegetables are going to be less likely to be obese and get diabetes and have all of these uh, diet-related diseases. There's an educational component, which is really important. And there's a quality of life piece as well. I mean, the difference I know personally between mowing a <laughs> lawn and hoeing corn is actually substantial. And I feel much better after I hoe corn than after I mow a lawn. Um, and so, so that's important as well. And I think it points to this space that's emerging, which is the kind of space between a, a nonprofit and a for-profit, where there's lots of different kinds of value that a place like this can create. And we should, we should assign that honestly. Um, and it can be between like a .org and a .com and mm -hmm. still have real value for us. And we can be comfortable with that ambiguity. Yeah, just one uh, story I wanted to share about that. I was able to interview the architectural photographer Julius Shulman about two years ago. He passed away last year at the age of 98. 
And during the course of our conversation, I was telling him about our tomatoes in our backyard and how my then three-year-old loved nothing more than to go out there and pick them. And he was 97 years old at the time, and he stopped and got really quiet for a while, and he said, oh, I grew up on a farm in Connecticut, and I'm just having this most amazing memory of walking down past the tomato plants and picking them off the vine and, and really what that was like and how wonderful that was. And I thought to myself, wow, that was m over 90 years ago, and he's just having this sort of amazing memory of that. And so I think it is really important to... Uh, sort of remember that aspect of it in all of this, uh, regardless of what Caitlin Flanagan may write about the experience. <laughs> um, I want to open it up for a bit. If there's any questions from the audience, then we'll right there. Wait till uh, Scott comes to you with a microphone. Though. Oh, one second, one second. <laughs> Sorry, we're recording this, so we want everyone to enunciate clearly. Yeah, I'll try to enunciate. <laughs> um, is there any connection in any programs between... Got to put it right up there. It's not between um, um, urban agriculture and green roofs? Connection between urban agriculture and green roofs. Funny you should ask that. I, you might be able to answer <laughs> Go ahead. Someone sent me something today. Um, in DC, there's a new program that you can, and I brought the info so I can share it correctly. Um, you can retrofit a roof um, to be a green roof. So that can be just a simple green roof with small seed and plants or a vegetable garden. and um, the innovative program provides seven dollars per square foot for green roofs um, for property owners in DC um, as a rebate and um, that's a, a program of DC Department of Environment and the Anacostia Watershed Society um, I think that you're we have in a city like DC where we have tremendous amounts of flat buildings um, I whenever I fly into National Airport I'm just drooling over the potential for urban agriculture on top of all these roofs um, and a lot of them are really old buildings and very well-built buildings that probably have the structural capacity to hold, um, hold farms on top of the roofs. There, there's, go ahead. No, you go ahead. there's plenty of examples out there that exist where this has been successful. The ones that I've seen that work best when they're above restaurants, when you can just walk it downstairs. And a lot of the work that has been done on green roofs in cities has really been for stormwater management. And there is this sense of instead of contributing to the good in this case, that because of sediment runoff or other nutrients that may be in the soil that are coming off, that it might not be a great thing. So you have a lot of uh, departments that are charged with doing this for stormwater are not necessarily supportive. So we've been looking at doing some tests to show that indeed they can be complementary. I mean, the same thing happens. There's, there's a lot of um, municipalities that are looking at solar access as well and don't want to mess with the roofs. Uh, ability to get to the roof is usually a problem. A lot of those buildings aren't structurally sound so, and they can be expensive in that way. But it's certainly, there, there are a lot of, uh, when it all comes together right, it's really a wonderful thing. And whenever you cover a permeable dark surface or concrete surface with something that's, uh, or an impermeable surface with something that is permeable, excuse me, then you're also help, helping combat the urban heat, heat, a heat island effect as well. So environmentally, it's, gonna, it's going to help, um, help combat global warming if we, if we do more urban agriculture on our roofs as well. It's amazing that all those industrial areas are this just black instead of we right. need to go out and paint them all white. And, and at the very least, and then we'll, I'll take your question, um, there's an architect doing a lot of affordable housing uh, in San Francisco where I live, and on a recent project, they've installed uh, cow troughs on top, and each unit sort of gets its own sp space on the roof to grow in containers as opposed to the roof. So there's ways to do that without having the same structural integrity problems. Um, right there with the red scarf. Hi, um, I was curious if there has been any studies regarding residual toxicity in food grew, grown either in urban areas or potentially brownfields. Not that I know of. I do, I Residual toxicity in food grown in urban areas. Yeah, absolutely. You need to test your soil before you plant uh, in cities that, are, um, that have a strong um, industrial heritage. You end out with heavy metals sometimes. But you can always mitigate. You can either build raised beds and, and plant above. You can, if it's really bad, you can cart the soil away. That becomes a very expensive capital project. Um, or you can amend heavily with organic matter, depending on what you find when you do the tests, and actually uh, be all right. But it just depends on what you find when you do the test, but absolutely do the test. 
And as far as remediation goes, mushrooms are known to remediate soils as well. Paul Stamets is the leading expert on mushroom remediation, um, both in urban and non-urban Superfund site environments as well. But, but I think your question was, has there been any large-scale studies to determine in urban areas, is there more of that tort, sort of toxicity? And I haven't seen any, and I think it's really because you know, it really varies so much from city to city. Um, also, I would just add, uh, having driven through this Central Valley and marveled at all the close proximity of agricultural fields to the freeway and to other industrial production, I, I sometimes wonder if the city isn't cleaner than, <laughs> than a lot of the stuff that, that's growing out there. Um, in the red jacket. Who's going to take on the USDA? Who keeps telling Americans that their food should be cheap? And farmers have a really difficult time getting a fair price because of this paradigm and, of course, the subsidies to agribusiness and the health care costs from the adulterated conventional food are not reflected in the price people pay. Um, the USDA also insists that organic is merely a marketing tool, that there's no difference between organic food and conventional and grown food, and the USDA promotes atrazine and Roundup as textbook farming practices to conventional farmer. And I just want to make a comment about lawns. I grew, um, I, I stopped mowing on my little yards, and what emerged was a wonderful, biodiverse, chemical-free, um, beautiful uh, plants and flowers that captured storm water, that attracted pollinators. And I was surrounded by these yellow toxic chemical signs. And I was the one in violation of my county's lawn and yard code, Montgomery County, in, um, Maryland. And I had to mow to the ground. So starting with those coats would be um, a very good place. Thank you. Great. Who wants to take on the USDA? <laughs> you did, right? uh, yeah, you asked, you asked who, who, who is going to take on the USDA. I'm taking on the USDA. Um, well, First of all, the USDA is a lot of things, and it, the Deputy Secretary was instrumental in creating, Kathleen Merrigan was instrumental in creating the National Organic Standards, is really a fantastic advocate for local sustainable agriculture, and the Secretary, Secretary Vilsack, even though he comes from a big ag background, has made it very clear um, to Slow Food and to other advocates that he doesn't work for big ag anymore, he works for the President, and the President's made it very clear to him that he should have some priorities that, for, and front and center for, for USDA right now is child nutrition, and making sure that kids have real food in schools uh, that, in a way that will help take on childhood obesity. So the USDA is a really different organization um, in, in January 2010 than it was in uh, January uh, 2000, 2009, actually. Um, it's, it's been transformed in, in a lot of ways. Now that said, there's a, there's a big fight in the, not a fight, there's a, I think there's a philosophical disagreement within the administration and, and within the USDA about whether um, this, what is now just 2% of, of American agriculture, which is the agriculture that is good for the environment, the agriculture that's good for people, um, the agriculture that's good for land, good for children, the kind of agriculture and food that I think a lot of us um, would believe in, ultimately, whether that is the future of American agriculture or whether that is a cute little thing on the side and the 98% is the norm. Um, I believe that the undersecretary is firmly committed to that 2% 2, 2 being the future of American agriculture. And what it will take to make that change happen is something that involves all of us. So your question started with who is going to take on the USDA. We've all got to take on these issues in a really deep way. And when you push Obama, and I've heard this from a supporter of ours who actually pushed Obama on this issue and said, we need to take on farm subsidies, we need to take on school lunch and really change them and make them better, his response is remarkable. And he says, um, I agree with you entirely, but if you want to see me, any, see me do anything about it, you have to show me the social movement that makes me do it. And what that does is it rewrites our job descriptions, it broadens our job descriptions as citizens. And it says, you can't just elect someone as your leader, you have to push them to move forward in the right way. You have to push your legislators, your representatives in Congress to make good policy. And so what we're doing at Slow Food USA now is really helping, uh, trying as hard as we can to move forward um, what is becoming a really important social movement that's pushing for a food policy that's good for people and good for the land. Um, 
It also broadens our job description in another way. I think in the history of the sustainable food movement, for a long time we've started with the idea that you can, you can kind of shop your way to heaven. Like if you just go to the farmer's market and you buy the right stuff, you'll be doing the right thing and that's enough. And what Obama is saying when he says, show me the social movement that makes me do it, is there are big structural barriers to the kind of food and farming that we believe we should have in this country. They're really big and there are entrenched interests that want to keep those barriers there. If you want to make them go away, you can't just go to the farmer's market. Go to the farmer's market and when you get home, invite a bunch of people to dinner, uh, talk to them about these issues, and then get in touch with your legislator and push them when the issue comes up. Uh, the big points uh, to watch, the, the next one is going to be child nutrition, uh, which determines what 30 million America's poorest kids eat every day for lunch. And following that in 2012, 2013, uh, will be the farm bill, which is where those subsidies are. If you're going to make a dent in the farm bill, we have to have a growing, powerful social movement that really pushes legislators to do something different. We didn't really uh, transform it last time it, uh, it went up in 2007, 2008. And next time, I hope we can, we can do better, but it's going to take everyone here uh, getting involved. And, and there was a small dent. Um, and I think that there was a discussion that you did not hear in previous years when the farm bill was up. For the first time, people were talking about this needs to be a food bill. Uh, people were talking about this idea that I mentioned before that, that, that fruit and vegetables are specialty crops I is ridiculous. And it's the same message I know that Michael Pollan is taking around the country as, as well as, as he goes and speaks is that he's been told, you know, show us where the movement is. I mean, right now, lobbyists spend something like $35,000 a day on every legislator. And to counteract that, it's going to take all the voices in this room. It's going to do things as well. We need to do things on our local level. So some of those ridiculous policies in terms of that you can't do what you want need to be changed as well. But I think that, again, it's looking at that kind of behavior and changing it on a local level and all those boats rise. And it's really going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting fight here uh, for, for the next farm bill. And I think a lot of people are mobilizing for that. But if it's up to the citizens, if that's what Obama is saying, what, what should this woman do with her backyard if she has to mow it? And my neighbor up in Columbia Heights had corn growing, and his neighbors all got very upset with him for growing corn in his front yard um, and had petitions to get him to take it down and reestablish his lawn. So what, what, do, what, what, what should this woman do in Montgomery County, Maryland? That's a great question. I'm not, I'm not a local zoning <laughs> like guy, but it question. sounds like that's something that you probably deal with more directly because yeah, it's I, a city scale thing. I'd is anybody here from Portland? <laughs> yeah, I always want to do that to see what I can get away with. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were talking about the bubble uh, before in terms of where we live and, and certainly there is great support to remove any of those obstacles or barriers to allow you to grow food in the city. It's a matter, I think, just in terms of Montgomery County, of finding th there's got to be one city councilor, one city person that's willing to kind of champion it for you. No? Oh, we, get, get a mic down here. We got someone who works for Montgomery County. <laughs> We're going to fix it right here. It's, this is a done deal tonight. Watch us. Got it. Hi, I work for the county right now, and we're in the middle of doing a zoning rewrite so that we can grow corn, wheat, I mean, and fruits and vegetables in urban areas. And that's why I'm here tonight, to learn more about it. That's great. Has, has that been a battle, or has it been, is it going fairly it's, smoothly? Or? No, it's, it's not going smoothly. It's, oh. the, <laughs> it's at the county council right now, and there's a lot of pushback. For specific reasons, like people do complain, it's, an, it's a wealthy county, and right. a lot of people do want green lawns. And so there's a lot of, you know, there's, there is definitely pushback. But, but there's some people who are, there's a, a big movement that is trying to push it through, and I think it'll happen. On that note, I think it is really important, um, even though I asked the question, but it is really important to think of our city officials as allies. And um, in D.C., we have our, our, own, our own sort of situations to deal with, and Portland does too, and every city does, and Montgomery County does. But um, Common Good City Farm has, has pushed through... Um, a 13-month struggle to get the land that we're on, um, which is an old D.C. public school um, facility that was closed. And, and I'm hoping that by the headway that we made, um, that, that it will be easier for gardens in the future. And, and people in the mayor's office were supportive, and, um, and, and nonprofits have started to partner with us. And through a lot of other partnerships with for-profit and nonprofit and elected city officials, um, council members, We've made headway in D.C. and are continuously doing that. And so I, as, as much as it can be frustrating, I do 
really, really recommend finding allies within within your counties or where whatever whatever environment you live in that that um, your your city infrastructure is. I also think that it's it's sort of a really opportune time. Um, I've written about architecture for years and did a lot of research while I was at IDEO about uh, master plan community development and was actually shocked to find out how important resale value was. I mean, you know it's important, but really above, it would exceed all else in people's description of the house they live in and the neighborhood that they live in. Will I be able to sell this for more than I bought it for? And that's why they want the lawn and they don't want the, not, not even that they're enjoying the lawn, but they think that no one will buy their house if the lawn isn't there. And there's a fantastic effort, granted it's small, but a great effort called Edible Estates, Attack on the Front Lawn that Fritz Haig has done that probably a lot of you are aware. And I was in Piedmont, a very wealthy suburb uh, uh, in the East Bay uh, not long ago. And amidst all the lawns, I saw these people who had put raised beds out in front of their $2 million house in Piedmont. And I was so excited <laughs> to see this. And I'm sure they were getting a lot of flack, but y you have to start and we all have to fight the fight because I think there's always someone's initial response to say no. And HOAs have only made this worse. And, and now that people are in a situation where uh, their houses are probably worth anywhere from a tenth to you know 20 percent of what they're worth resale value has become less of an issue so i think it's a really opportune time to get in there especially on the mm. sort of local and neighborhood level and zoning because you it's pretty hard to make that fight now because you've lost your resale value so <laughs> grow corn on the front lawn you know it's fine can i throw something out yeah. related to that when those fights come up don't forget that there are opportunities i remember when i lived in new haven connecticut there was a fight about chickens could you keep chickens in your backyard and one un unintended consequence of that fight was that all of the people in New Haven, Connecticut, who cared about local food systems, who had gardens, who had chickens, they all had dinner together a few times to talk about what they were going to do about this ordinance. And it built community within the community, within the city. It built a community of people who really cared about this and were willing to advocate together. And that is a really valuable resource and something that's incredibly hard to generate. So those issues can actually be opportunities. And don't forget when they come up to, to use them as such. Yeah, and if, if your community doesn't have a food policy council, now is a good time to start one. Uh, right up there. Uh, hopefully the time will come soon when actually having good raised beds in front of your yard will raise the right. value of the home <laughs> yeah. as opposed to a lawn, <laughs> which sort of connects to what I'm going to ask, which is about the issue of business models for urban agriculture. And it seems that, that those models that you're talking about, getting the better models, sort of assume that the economy will sort of maintain at its current rate and that, you know, the food supply from industrial agriculture will stay at its current rate. Both propositions, which may not, in fact, be accurate for the, you know, the near to medium term future. So I'm wondering if the idea of urban agriculture and people growing their own food has as much to do with new models of community and new economic models as it does for new business models and that maybe some of the millions of unemployed people would be happy to get $11,000 a year walking around money if at the same time they were fed and had a place to live. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's expanding our vision of what type of models we're looking for to promote this agriculture. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's an absolutely great point. And there was a wonderful story in San Jose where an or and I apologize, I can't remember now the name of the organization because there really are so many great projects going on now, which is the, the good news about all of this. A group that comes in to low-income families in San Jose and helps them establish their own backyard gardens and uh, mostly sort of like low-income Hispanic immigrants. And they actually realized quite quickly how much money they were saving. Like, oh, it cost me $2 for a bunch of cilantro at the market. Now we're growing it out back and realizing almost immediately the economic benefits of, of doing this within their own communities, which, which you know, leads to exactly what you're talking about. They're not, they don't need to earn money off of growing it, but the amount of money that they're saving to feed you know, almost not just their own home, but people in their neighborhood as well, uh, I think evidence of stuff like that is, is everywhere. Um, this woman in white in the front. I used to have long arms. Um, I'd like to get back to the lawn uh, discussion a little bit more and, and go at it from another angle of uh, trying to make lawns not cool, kind of like <laughs> cigarettes used to be cool and now they're not. My biggest concern, or one of my big concerns, is uh, there just seems to be no lessening of the availability of uh, fertilizers 
and other toxins that are readily available to anybody who will dump more and more on it and, and continue to pollute our waterways. And I'd like to challenge the, the orthos and the scots and with all due respect, Home Depot for selling that crap, pardon my French, but it's, there's no change and it just seems to be so strong with that business model of people are gonna continue to buy it because lawns are so cool and we want them so much. So could you talk about that a little bit more and get us juiced up and go out here so we can talk to our Home Depot representative to change the world? <laughs> One thing I would say is I, I think that garden retailers, whether it's Home Depot or Lowe's or independent retailers, have an incredible opportunity to capitalize on the interest in, in urban and suburban agriculture. Uh, this last year, seven million new families planted gardens, vegetable gardens for the first time. And retail seed packets, those little seed packets you can get at, at garden centers for vegetable seeds, there was, a, there was an increase of roughly 35% in sales just over this last year. Uh, that's an incredible trend. I mean, a, a stupendous trend. And it's a great market opportunity for the group that was just selling Scott's products and, and, uh, and seed for lawns and things like that to turn around and instead sell heritage vegetable, heirloom vegetable varieties and compost. Um, and and it's, a, it's a real financial opportunity for them. So I think that recognizing that is, is an important first step. I think it's an interesting, very interesting question. In the town that I grew up in, in uh, Canandaigua, New York, which is right on one of the Finger Lakes, um, the, the largest grocery store and the, the Walmart in the area um, decided to not sell um, dishwashing and washing detergent with phosphates in it because it was getting into the, into the lake. Um, and so that instantly basically inhibits people from buying those things if, unless they're going to shop out of the town, which most people aren't doing. Here in D.C. recently, the plastic bag law that you're all probably quite familiar and hopefully supportive of um, is, is another really great example and um, that D.C. Department of Environment you know, really went, went at bat to get that to, to help our Chesapeake Bay and protect the waterways here. So um, our dollar is our, is our vote in a lot of ways and what we, what we support with what we purchase at the store or at the farmer's market or what kind of food you eat can, can really influence those things. So I think we've grown in this, this last year, as, as you mentioned, the American, American Garden Association says that it was, we went from like 36 to 42 million backyard gardeners. And what have we got about 308 million people. That's so probably, I'm figuring doing the math, but about 15% of the market. So I think this is really market driven. And the more and more people that we can get involved in this enterprise, the more that, I mean, they're not going to sell it unless there's a market that's there. And my sense is, as I see more and more of these lawns being taken out, and it's not like it's, you're, you're taking something out and establishing something that doesn't look good because, I mean, I think edible landscaping and using permaculture and all of the things that we can do are, are really beautiful and much more beautiful than lawns are. So I think the more that people see this kind of activity and the more and more people do it, at least certainly in Portland, it seems that there's a new kind of natural gardening store or kind of urban farm stores that are growing up all the time because more and more people are doing it. So it, it, again, it's, it's, as, as more and more of this happens, the more and more we'll see that people will selling the kinds of products that we want to see being sold. And I do think there continues to be varying points of entry for change. Uh, I interviewed a landscape architect in Santa Monica recently, and the city has passed such stringent restrictions on what you can plant, where you can plant it, how you water it, that they actually approve your plant list, then come to the place and actually make sure that you planted everything that you said you were going to plant. So there's no messing around in Santa Monica. And, and I imagine um, part of the reason why everyone has these lawns is that water's so cheap, and that's not happening for much longer. And I think once people really get a sense that water's not going to be one penny a gallon or whatever it is in, in most municipalities, that, that that will have to sort of drive change as well. So it's sort of happening at all, all spots. Um, you just pick them, Scott. That's fine. <laughs> Hi, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about the role of waste and composting and creating an economic um, sustainable model for urban agriculture because we've been focusing a lot about on production. Yeah, the big, the big impacts are upstream, as we always see in the, the work that we do in recycling. Uh, 
35%, 25%, some places up to 50%, and certainly in, in the system as a whole, 50% of our food is wasted. So we're looking at, and I, and I know we were talking about in, in your community that you're able to compost, and we go to places that it isn't happening, and it is a resource that is just being thrown away. In Portland, there is uh, composting right now for uh, restaurants and for commercial users. We're going to be instituting composting, uh, home composting, and pickup. Uh, it's the pilot project starts in a couple months, and up in Seattle they're doing the same. But that is obviously, the, when we talk about the food system, we're not only talking about the production and the distribution and eating the food, but it's also what we do with that food when it ends. There's a new book out, uh, Tristan Stewart, who I know has written on vegetarianism in the past, has a brand new book out called Waste. And for any of you who are interested in that, uh, it's a great book to pick up. It just recently came out in the last couple months. And it really is something that we need to look at because we are squandering a huge resource there. Yet San Francisco, I believe, is now composting 70% of its waste. And it becomes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that it's sort of convincing cities that they, they have some economic gain from that because San Francisco certainly has. And I have to say, it's become absolutely addictive in, mm. since they've instituted it. We were just talking earlier that I was in New York and I think I carried my apple core for about 20 minutes. Mm. Like, what do I do with this thing? I can't put this in the trash can, you know? And, and if you teach a little kid to do that, they're always gonna do it. Um, which you know, I think we all sort of implicit in this discussion is getting this in to the brains of little ones. Uh, I don't see how they could ever change those habits once, once they start doing them. So I'm a huge fan. We have a worm compost, a backyard compost, and a city compost. We have about one bag of garbage every week. We're able to eliminate almost everything. And it's, it just it feels good. It's the right thing to do. Um, I know people get grossed out about it, <laughs> and I think that that's their hesitation. But I'm actually quite obsessed with how much compost. <laughs> it's another place to also have some try to push our city officials and um, to have infrastructure where you you're collecting. They collect recycle. They collect compost. Um, they collect garbage. But that that's one of the things that's collected. And there's also this great waste equals food sort of scenario that, especially in cities where there's so many resources that people are constantly tossing away. That's how we got our start um, as the Seventh Street Garden was because we were great gleaners in alleyways and in taking other people's waste and, and using it to to start our infrastructure. Um, our leaves that are that we brush off of our front yards or brush out of our streets is an amazing resource to put into a garden if you're trying to develop one. Um, or wood chips from trees that are being knocked down all the time. We get them by the truckload at, at Common Good, um, and it's free, and they're, they're happy to drop it off. Um, so there's, there's a lot of potential within our cities to, to create these great cycles of waste equals food. Speaking of new business models, uh, in late October, I think it was, I got a flyer for a place called Arga Organica Farm Club. Mm -hmm. They operate out of Charlottesville, and what they do is they work with numerous farms in Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania, and um, they deliver to my door every Thursday fruits, vegetables, meat, yogurt, just um, fresh pasta, just about anything that I can buy at the grocery store. Um, they're just a few months old, but I was wondering if you've heard of a similar business model in other cities that's not the typical CSA where you get a box of mystery vegetables, but you actually get what you order. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and in some countries, it's the norm. I was just speaking with someone who was working with Slow Food in Japan, and um, there it is, it is where people get their food. Uh, that, is, that is how a huge percentage of the population shops in some, in some of the cities there, and it's fairly well established and pretty nuanced. You can pick what you get and it supports a huge number of farmers and has supported a new back to the land movement for young farmers. Um, and it's, uh, it's incredible, I think, when you see those models in some cities where it has become the norm, just to think about what potential there is for, uh, for, for completely re-envisioning how, how we do things here. And I think CSAs are constantly expanding their offerings as well. I've seen that happen over the last couple of years. It used to be just that box of fruit and vegetables, then it became maybe some flowers, then it was eggs, and now I do see some pastas and other things that are included in the box, or you can sign on for an additional all of your dairy if you want. Uh, I even learned about an ice cream CSA the other week. Mm -hmm organic and all sort of specialized. Now that's kind of a, a tricky one to get. That's, that's a real San Francisco <laughs> thing. Sort of like high risk, 
high risk endeavor. Uh, and there's meat clubs, mm -hmm. and I went to something last month called the Pork Prom, where everyone stood in line for nearly two hours to pick up their heirloom pork, and people in line were like, well, in my other meat club, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I live in the Bay Area, so people are nuts about this. And, and I think uh, I always have to keep reminding myself that I do live amidst a bunch of nuts who agree with most of what I'm saying and that there's a lot of work to be done elsewhere. But it's exciting to see. So in terms of uh, providing access uh, to locally grown food to low-income com communities, uh, what I'm aware is, like, so far, um, Urban farms that are around the country are mostly uh, championed by the communities themselves. I just want to hear a little bit more about like what you guys are doing and what you may be aware of others are doing that are uh, trying to uh, create more of a movement uh, regionally and nationally. Great. One thing that I think really defines the sustainable food movement right now is this, uh, it's a real problem, it's a real challenge, is that the, the, the largest group of people who are publicly involved in it and you typically look to um, as sort of members of organizations or people who are uh, shopping and in a way that reflects their values, they're not the people who are hurt most by the way food and farming works in this country. Uh, food and farming disproportionately hurts poor people and people of color. And poor people and people of color are not the people who typically make up um, slow food membership, honestly. Uh, the people who shop at farmers markets, honestly. And that's a real problem of uh, for a few reasons. One, I think it's uh, something that the movement, the farmer's market's missing out on. There's this incredible energy and need and, and in some cases outrage among those communities that they are so disserved. And tapping into that energy could move a movement a lot farther, but it's also a disservice in that it's completely, uh, I think, uh, unjust on some level. I mean, I think we've, we've historically as a movement talked about this as something that's based in values. So I've seen the, the, the old guard and the sustainable food movement answer this question, you know, how, how can you uh, push people um, who are low income to go shop at a farmer's market? And the response normally goes something like this, and it is, well, they need to understand that this food is worth more. Uh, I think that that is a completely unacceptable answer at this point. Um, that is a slap in the face, and it drives those people, when they hear that answer, into the hands into the cash registers of the same bad actors that are ultimately hurting them. Uh, instead, I think we need to say food that is good for your kids, food that isn't predicated on hurting the environment, that's a universal right. Uh, it's not a privilege. And everyone deserves access to that right. And that means, like I said before, that, that we can't be just satisfied with shopping our, our values. We need to shop our values, but also work on removing some of the big structural barriers to everyone being able to access food that's good for them and good for their kids. What those projects are and how it works is a complicated question. I think there's a few guiding things that matter a lot. One is that the solutions need to be locally owned. I, I don't want to see um, big foundations, big organizations, even our organization, Slow Food USA, come in and bring solutions to communities. Instead, I think we need to ask, honestly, is there anything we can do to help? And look at what emerges uh, naturally in those communities. And there are some fantastic examples. I think of in Oakland, the People's Grocery, um, which is uh, doing incredible work with local urban agriculture, with local food distribution. They're looking at creating a locally owned supermarket in a community that's completely food insecure. I was just in Detroit where uh, there's some incredible projects happening with, with local agriculture that are all locally owned projects and they're addressing food insecurity in a really deep way. I was at the Catherine Ferguson Academy, which is this incredible school uh, for pregnant teenagers and, and teenage mothers. And they have a beautiful, beautiful organic farm on campus. They're raising their own eggs. They're raising, uh, interesting, they started raising eggs as a science project. It started this way because um, with pregnant mothers, they were worried about the chemicals that they would use in science class to hold em embryos and other animals for dissection. So they ended up starting raising chickens to have eggs. The science teacher had this idea and it blossomed into an incredible organic farm with greenhouses and local food production. They eat that in the community. They sell it in their community as well. Unfortunately, the food service in this public school is the same garbage that you see everywhere where they're eating Hot Pockets and getting Tootsie Rolls for dessert. Um, and they, the kids who walk to this school in the morning have no place to get breakfast. They eat potato chips and drink a Coke uh, on, the, on the street as they walk to school. But there's this incredible locally generated solution there. And some of our chapters through Slow Food Start projects that help address some of these issues, particularly with schools. In, in Harlem, there's an incredible 
program that was started by a New York chapter called, called Harvest Time in Harlem, where local volunteers work in this public school to do cooking education. They have a garden, and they've established actually a farmer's market on the public school grounds that serves the community, um, which doesn't have access to real food otherwise. So there's a whole lot of projects like that that need to be addressed. And then we need to deal with some big structural issues, uh, particularly issues in the Farm Bill, that make, uh, that make the default for these communities food that makes them sick. Uh, and that's something I think we also all bear responsibility to work on together. I was also happy to see I wrote a big piece on uh, Kaiser Permanente's mm -hmm. Innovation Lab recently. And Kaiser has farmers markets now at 35 of its hospital facilities. And I think continuing to make these connections, and when we were talking before, we sort of talked about the interconnectivity of all of these things and how we need to sort of continue to alert decision makers as, you know, from the decision makers to the community organizers to the fact that healthcare and the environment and food and farm and all these things are so inextricably intertwined that uh, solving one problem can help another one and uh, things that, you know, most of this audience is already aware, but that most people just aren't making the connections between. And I think that's, that's a huge project. To mention there is something that might be of interest to many people um, because of the number of architects and designers. Uh, yeah, the, the, the question of uh, examples out there that, uh, that might be available, uh, just to mention that uh, we organized an exhibit uh, last year in Toronto called Design, uh, Carrot City Designing for Urban Agriculture. And uh, we just put up uh, all the content online. If you Google Carrot City, you will find it and hopefully we'll hope to bring it to here in future date. But uh, anyway, because it's a res resource like uh, on the question of uh, green roofs, uh, there's maybe um, 10 examples in there that are specifically about productive green roofs, just to cite one. Um, can I provoke something really quick? We've been talking a lot about the food that um, we grow to consume. But can you also, can the panel address food, the value of food that's grown in the public realm for food literacy and the importance of that. Um, the, not necessarily for food that we eat, which is important, but just to showcase where food comes from to the general public. Um, well, I'll start, and I think everyone will have an example. Of, not this summer, but the summer before, uh, I was involved in a small way in the Slow Food Nation Festival in San Francisco and a group sort of headed by Future Farmers and Rebar, two art activist organizations in the city uh, and other collaborators, actually planted a victory garden in Civic Center Plaza in the city. And this was one of these projects, it, it'd be sort of like putting one in the mall, like no fence around it, no barriers, nothing. And, and in the beginning, everyone was like, ah, oh, this is never gonna happen. You know, homeless people are gonna sleep in it and people are gonna steal the food. And it ended up being the most amazing, incredible project in the day that everyone sort of came together to uh, plant it. I've never seen sort of a greater diversity of people in the same space in San Francisco, I think in one day. Uh, children, dogs, all sort of ethnicities, ages, everything else. And that was up for several months and I think was an excellent demonstration of what can happen. And there was uh, trilingual signage involved so you could see what was growing. Uh, food events happen that used food sort of sourced from that garden and I wish that it could have been there all the time. I think they donated uh, most of that stuff to a school garden from there too. But that was a great uh, example of heavily trafficked area right next to a BART station, right next to City Hall where people of all types are coming and going for jury duty and whatever else all day. Uh, it was kind of a textbook example of, of what to do, I think, in that arena. But I'm sure you have others. Too. So you mentioned it would be like creating a garden on the mall. I know this is a transient city, but some of you must have lived here in 2006. <laughs> and in the, in the summer uh, for the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, um, I, helped, I helped design an, a, a garden that was put in the mall with a lot of other people who are fantastic farmers from all over the country and some garden designers. And we installed uh, this garden. Had, had, do any of you remember this? Some of you? Some. There's a vegetable garden right in the middle of the mall, and it, was, it produced food, which was great, but the food was really secondary. The point was really to get people engaged in the idea that food comes from someplace. Mm -hmm. We brought, a, uh, uh, brought and assembled a wood-fired pizza oven there and cooked these meals right out of the garden with ingredients from the garden and connected people to that space. And I saw two revelatory moments. One was a, a little girl who was walking through who said, um, I, I don't like tomatoes. And I said, well, have you ever picked a tomato? And she said, no. And I said, well, let's pick a tomato together. And I walked her over to a tomato plant, and she picked a tomato. And then I said, do you want to taste it? And she said, yeah, okay, I'll taste it. And she tasted it. And then she turned to her mom, and she says, I love tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then I basically saw Hillary Clinton do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Because we had this lunch where all of these legislators came to the table and we cooked a beautiful pizza out of this oven and a lot of these incredible leaders who I look up to in other, in other ways came and sat down and we talked about food and where it comes from and how it relates to children's health and how it relates to policy but also how it relates to memory and culture and family. And that experience, um, it filled their bellies but I think it also changed their minds and the power of being connected to the way you grow your food and then sharing it. Um, changes people's minds. Uh, and I think that we need to recognize that as a value in urban agriculture almost as much as, as the food it produces. Uh, the, I, mean, I think the great thing about, about my job um, and about urban agriculture is that it is all about food and that we all eat and we all love to eat. And so when it comes down to it, the basic, basic part of it is just that it's, it's always really, it can be really exciting, it can be really overwhelming. There's all these huge issues, but um, when I get really overwhelmed, I go go to the farm and hang out with the people who are there and the kids. And um, it's pretty magical to to watch the kid pull the carrot out of the ground or eat the tomato. Um, I was a tomato hater for a long time <laughs> um, until I started growing my own. Um, this season, we grew popcorn at the farm. The kids planted the popcorn, um, watered the popcorn plant, um, and then we harvested it and made popcorn. Um, and that was magical to watch. Um, made fried green tomatoes with the kids and throughout the season the kids were the easy ones to get to cross the street or to come through the, the fence and, and see what was going on. Um, and then slowly as the season goes on they start walking parents across the street to, to see what they're growing um, and take ownership over, over their plants and um, want to know why the leaves are turning yellow and see what they can do to make it better. Or, are they too much water, too little water? And it's a really tangible thing. And I think um, getting to the person's question in the back about our low-income communities, too, is really finding that niche that, um, that, that gets to each individual, whether it's an adult or a kid or a senior. And the intergenerational capacity of each of these gardens in cities, um, there's people everywhere. And really, is it tomatoes or is it cooking or um, is it painting? But there's almost something for everybody in urban agriculture, in, in an urban garden. Um, finding what what little thing is going to get that one person involved that that you've been trying to get involved, and in. it might not be an obvious answer at first, but I think that's it's pretty magical. For me, it goes back to where we were, where I originally said is that it really is a matter of connecting again and we are all eaters it's amazing to me that when we had in the city an office of sustainable development which is where this food program started we had programs in solid waste and recycling and energy and green building and not food which is still so basic to all of us i, mean, I always said that it was f food was definitely the, the gateway drug to sustainability um, because we do all eat and there are so many projects and, and programs that I think that we've all seen. That we've seen that, that dignity, that connection. There, there, there's one in particular that I, that I really love in Portland that takes place in a number of affordable housing projects. And they've taken and they put gardens in these areas. And um, it is an intergenerational thing. It's kids that have now become mentors for other kids who, who would be doing gang stuff if there was nothing else going on. But they've really gone in and, and, and the group that does this goes in as we're visitors to your community. What can we do to help? But they have in some ways been able to set up that infrastructure where they're able to grow offsite as well. So they're making money for these kids. They're selling their greens at farmers markets and have been very successful. They're selling a commensurate, commensurate amount of food uh, or bringing, excuse me, a commensurate amount of food back to the housing projects as well so people can eat there. And when you listen to these older women who had some degree of, um, of experience in gardens when they were younger, talk about the peace and the tranquility that it brings them to go to the gardens. And when you look at the community capacity that has been built by these people getting to know each other, it, it's a very interesting development where, where some of the homes are owned, some of them are rental, and they've all been able to come together, multi-ethnic group, around this shared love of, of growing food and tasting the food that they now have cooking courses that they have on site as well and a number of programs that um, have been kind of workforce development they've got some grants to be able to bring some of the people from the community to our 
local food policy council meetings and integrate folks within the community. So food has been really this generator of so many wonderful things. Take one or two more, I think. Thank you. Um, I think we've heard of some really good examples of um, community and sort of nonprofit driven urban agriculture. But I'm wondering if there are any examples or ways to address uh, vast expanses of post-industrial landscapes or cities like Philadelphia and Detroit where you have miles of vacant and abandoned neighborhoods. I'm just wondering if they could be resources more at a state level or a country level. Just curious about that. Um, the question was about, uh, say, Philadelphia and Detroit, uh, sort of more blighted urban areas, um, and suburban ones as well. I was, uh, the new urbanist Andre Duane said that agriculture is the new golf, which is sort of my favorite quote of the year. And if you think about all those golf courses being replaced by urban agriculture, um, there's a, a lot of efforts. I don't know lots of specifics about them. You would know more of uh, urban agriculture happening in Detroit. Um, I'm certain there's something happening in Philadelphia. Well, if, one thing in Detroit that's really interesting that's happening is there's so much open space um, that there are two models emerging. One is this really fantastic network of local community gardeners who are developing these plots. And another is um, this guy, uh, I think his name is Hans, who has uh, bought up huge tracts of land and is developing a farm called Hans Farm in Detroit on all of this vacant space. And there are two models. Both of them, I think, have something to offer. The, the second one, Hans Farm, has definitely caused a sort of rift in the community where a lot of the farmers who, this was their plot next door, and after the house burned down, they managed to, the neighbor's house burned down, or after it was torn down, they managed to clear the plot and start a garden, and it's really theirs, and it's their communities, and the community is watching it, and the community's taking care of it because it's from the community. Um, they really resent seeing someone from the outside come in and buy up huge tracts of land and develop it, and. Um, the land has to be protected by putting fences around it because it's not the community's, it's someone else's resource. Um, but at the same time, he's bringing this capacity to deal with a scale of land that otherwise couldn't be done on, on its own. So a really interesting discourse, I think, emerges about ownership. But yeah, there's, there's huge opportunities in these places. Um, right up here. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with Philadelphia's program from a programmatic point of view, but I do know it uh, personally. And their program is um, community gardens, whereby you have uh, vacant land. And it was one of the brainstorming things that they, th that they thought, well, what do we do with all this vacant right. land? Well, let's uh, uh, parcel it out into community gardens. Every, you do put a, like a low and inoffensive fence around it. Each person gets their own plot within the community gardens. Um, you know, they live in the neighborhood nearby. They come over, plant whatever they want, uh, maintain it, take care of it. I mean, the idea was just to do something with all these vacant lots, mm -hmm. which uh, which Philadelphia had, uh, which they do not have on the same scale as Detroit. So I, c I can't see the same model uh, succeeding everywhere in Detroit. But that's, so that's my answer. We have one more. Thanks. Uh, so I think for the most part, our society takes for granted the availability and quality of food. But I think another resource that our society takes for granted is water. So if, if none of you have seen the film Flow, I would highly encourage you to see it, um, because water is going to have a, a great impact on our agricultural system. So what will, happen to the what will happen to the sustainable food movement with growing water shortages and lower water quality? And what are your, you doing as advocates and what are your organizations doing to address this issue? Sure. Um, what, it's, a, it's a great point. Um, so water potentially is the next oil. Um, and it's going to be, again, I'm messing this thing up. It's going to be, it's going to be a, um, a resource hard to come by and expensive, and um, that's a pretty serious concern. What we're doing at Common Good City Farm and a great, um, again, a resource in the city is that we have all these buildings and we can collect rainwater um, from the buildings. Uh, we have a grant from District Department of Environment to collect rainwater from the structures that we're building on the site, um, which are pretty small, but um, we'll collect water into a thousand gallon cistern and be able to hopefully irrigate the entirety of our farm with that water. Um, and 
and not have to use municipal water, um, and also then keep that water out of the stormwater systems here. Yeah, I also think uh, stormwater management is the new sexy uh, <laughs> career path in sustainability. Uh, it's, gonna, it's, it's a major need. Uh, it allows a couple things. It allows you to think about infrastructure as a lot of tiny little projects instead of one giant, expensive, big dig type of project, which is really important. Uh, it's something that even an individual can do um, and can help really sort of reduce the costs of water. Also, rainwater collection and rainwater harvesting. Um, I know that San Francisco has a ton of grants and initiatives right now to kind of spur people on to, to find ways to, to save and store. Um, drip irrigation, obviously, the kind of legislation that Santa Monica and other cities are passing to really limit um, how much use will happen in the future. But yeah, you're right, it's a huge, huge problem. One thing I, I would say is there's gonna be a interesting moment when the Clean Water Act is, is readdressed or renewed that looks at how funding can be, how federal funding can be used to deal with issues around stormwater. And when it was originally put in place, that funding was basically there um, for big plumbing projects. Right. So it's kind of a comp not complicated, but it's an esoteric issue. If you combine stormwater, so the water that runs down the street when you have a big rainstorm, with sewer water, with the water that goes to the sewer plant when you flush the toilet, at these certain moments when there are big storms, you get a huge volume of water running into the treatment plant and the plant can't handle it. That leads to pollution um, because it overflows. And so these big dig projects separate that out. And I don't know if any of you have lived in a city while this is happening, but you, you hope and pray that it's either happened on your block or that you move out of your apartment <laughs> before it comes to your block because yeah. it takes a long time and it's really loud. Um, and uh, so that's, that, instead of doing that, the notion is let's not have uh, all of this runoff when rain happens because we have bioswales, we have earth hilled up, we have gardens either edible or not, we have imp impermeable surfaces replaced with permeable ones so then water falls on the surface of a, of a building's roof, a flat roof, instead it percolates into the soil and plants uh, evaporate it back out into the atmosphere. So that's, that's that issue fleshed out a little bit more and I think it's really important and when that bill gets renewed, there'll be an interesting moment to see whether we can shift funding to some more nuanced ways of dealing with this that have other, uh, I think, positive impacts on, on place. Um, another thing is that water is a, also sometimes a really local issue. There are agricultural places and there are cities where water is in abundance in that place and maybe for a long time. There are some where it's a pinch point right now, there are some where it's a pinch point in the future. And so I think there's an opportunity for some really interesting local solutions to come up as people look at what the limiting factor is environmentally and, and create agricultural systems that address it. Um, that's one thing. Replacing lawns with gardens, particularly mulched gardens, is a great way of addressing this problem no matter where you are. And the last thing was just your, your premise, which I, I think was just really an introduction to your question, but it struck me it's something we haven't really talked about. You said we take for granted abundant, abundant cheap food. Um, and Earlier this year, a few studies came out really in close proximity to each other. One pointed out that one in six Americans is food insecure, meaning he or she doesn't know where a next meal is going to come from at a given point in the year. That's one sixth of our population. Simultaneously, studies are coming out that say one in three children under the age of 10 are going to uh, get diabetes because, they, uh, because of the food they're eating. Um, so there's this overconsumption and underconsumption simultaneously. The really interesting thing about that demographic is that it's the same demographic. Um, so on either side of, of poverty, this very fine line where either you are overfed or underfed, um, and that's a, it's a scary place and something that I, I, I don't think we should take for granted, even if we in this room are lucky enough to be able to take it for granted. And on a larger scale with water also as far as agriculture versus sustainable agriculture goes and if you, you're, if you support small farms um, because it's, it's local and because it's better food or organic food, it's also supporting a system that is conserving water. Um, large scale agriculture systems that are monocropped one plant per thousands of acres um, inherently use a lot more water than, than smaller sustainable farms. So that in itself is also helping conserve water. Um, maybe as a wrap-up, I know we have in the audience tonight, we have legislative aides from people who work up on the Hill, we have representatives from the USDA, we have planners, we have architects, we have landscape architects, and we have the general public who's really interested in this issue. What's the one takeaway that each of you would have for them to make a difference on this issue? 
It's a lot of different people. <laughs> <laughs> the one takeaway. Um, I would say, and this is easy and I'm taking the easy way out, but I think everyone here is very informed you're at this event. I guess I always feel, I watch Food Inc., I read Michael Pollan, and I'm so well aware of all the people who aren't. So any way that you can think of to uh, educate and advocate the people who are not aware of that. I mean, I'm lucky enough to have an op-ed piece for the Times when I can rant about whatever I feel like, and oftentimes will rant about this. But any opportunity to let people know, I'm always surprised, you know, people in my very, uh, you know, neighboring well-off Noe Valley or other parts of San Francisco who are like, why shouldn't I be buying meat at Safeway? Or why, why do you need to go buy apples at the farmer's market? Like people who I think know better really don't, don't know better. So sort of don't assume the level of, of knowledge on the part of people who you may interact with all the time and just don't be a boring, pedantic irritant, <laughs> but find a way whether, I think I love your idea of people who had dinner who didn't normally have dinner together and just find ways to integrate it in, in uh, normal discourse and, and behavior, I think can really uh, help. So. I, I was going to say, I think that we need to remember when we talk about cheap food, there really is no such thing as cheap food. That we realize that there are externalities of the food that we eat that we're not taking into that equation. I think when you have a system of food and food distribution and we grow something like 3,900 calories, you know, a day for everybody. It's 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 not a matter of the food not is not there, but in this particular case, when we look at uh, a system that is based on fast, and if I can use that word, cheap, it's really looking at that and trying to make the, I, I guess I would say the 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 right choice, the easy choice, is really what we want to do if we're going to be able to change behavior at all. Um, it is, it, when you look at, it, it, we, we could have probably in some ways talked about the, the healthcare system in the exact same way that we were talking about the food system when you have something that should be for the greater good of people and it is a profit-driven system. So if there's one way that we can somewhat divorce ourselves from that, and I would say it's, it's plant something whether or help somebody plant something. Or I, I was looking at, a, there was a website the other day for uh, a group out of New York. It's window farms. Mm -hmm. it, there, somebody, anyone know about this? I mean, it, it's, it's growing uh, vegetables in recycled plastic bottles. Go check them out. They're really trying to, 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 to make this thing take hold. But if there's one thing you can do, I mean, ha have, a, have a meal together, uh, have a meal with friends, but be thinking about those choices that you make every day when we do vote with our forks, all these cliches that we, that we use in, um, when we talk about food systems. But the number one thing, and certainly with urban agriculture, is even if it's just a tomato stuck in a pot, do it. I think it's two things. The first is for, for everyone in this room that in every place that you represent to talk to each other. Um, and whether it's not just walking out of this room and, and not talking to the person you're sitting next to, but, but the larger picture of that, um, both in person and on the internet, but not just on the internet or through your tweets. Um, I think that there's, excuse me, I think that there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of potential for, for community to be developed out of, out of this great movement. Um, and the other, the other thing I think to take away is to find your niche. Um, and I really think that there's something for everybody in, in this great food system. If you're a photographer, if you're a builder, or an economist, or whatever your thing is, it's somewhere within the food system from, from seed to fork, and, um, and, and find it, and then run with it, and see how you can help. You, you asked specifically about the planners and the legislative aides and the, the folks who are writing policies or making plans about how we do things as cities or as states or as countries. and. Um, I think they also should vote with their fork, and they should also have dinner. But I think in their work, when they, when they go to the office, um, I guess I would urge a few things. And they, they all fit together with, with one thing. When I, I took a planning class in college, and uh, the professor said, you know, most people, when they start planning, they start with a, with a black pen. St start with a green pen. Have a lot of green pens in your drawer. And start your planning with that. Um, what he was trying to do was to encourage us to, to begin with something that we normally add on at the end, which was green spaces. In, in this case, it was a, a class about green corridors and uh, open, open green spaces. I don't know what color pen the, the food one is. I've been trying to think about it since you asked the question, like you can't write with a fork. Um, but start with a fork. Like, think about 
my work, I'm going to put my work now through a food lens. And the reason I think that's important is not just because I like food, though I do, and I, not just because I like farmers, though I do. It's because every crisis that we face, um, whether it is the healthcare crisis, the public health crisis, whether it's a crisis in public education, or whether it's the climate crisis, uh, it's a crisis that on some level is born of the food we eat and the way that food's produced. Climate, greenhouse gases, are the number one cause globally is food production and distribution. Um, our healthcare costs, we spend $146 billion a year treating diet-related disease. Do you remember the, the, 10, the, the trillion dollar number that was thrown out that over the course of 10 years that uh, really upset everyone with the Obama plan? Let's, this is $1.46 trillion every 10 years. That's before these kids who one in three are gonna get diabetes get it. That's with a very low diabetes rate. We're gonna triple our diabetes rate over the next 20 years. When we do that, it's gonna be half a trillion dollars a year every year just on this cost. So you can't deal with this financial crisis we're gonna face around healthcare, with public health crisis, climate crisis, any of these crises without dealing with the food we eat and the way that food's produced. And so as you do your planning, as you do your legislating, whatever acronym you work for, even if it's not the USDA, um, think about how uh, how food and how farming play a role in the kind of solutions you're trying to bring uh, to the communities that you're helping, uh, helping plan. Great. I want to thank all of you and Scott for having us and all of you for coming.